The Gray Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. A Fairy's Blunder. Once upon a time there lived a fairy whose name was Dindonette. She was the best creature in the world, with the kindest heart, but she had not much sense, and was always doing things to benefit people, which generally ended in causing pain and distress to everybody concerned. No one knew this better than the inhabitants of an island far off in the midst of the sea, which, according to the laws of fairyland, she had taken under her special protection, thinking day and night of what she could do to make the isle the pleasantest place in the whole world as it was the most beautiful. Now what happened was this. As the fairy went about, unseen from house to house, she heard everywhere children longing for the time when they would be grown up, and able, they thought, to do as they liked, and old people talking about the past, and sighing to be young again. Is there no way to satisfy these poor things, she thought, and then one night an idea occurred to her. Oh, yes, of course, it has been tried before, but I will manage better than the rest with their old fountain of youth, which, after all, only made people young again. I will enchant the spring that bubbles up in the middle of the orchard, and the children that drink of it shall at once become grown men and women, and the old people return to the days of their childhood. And without stopping to consult one single other fairy who might have given her good advice, off rushed Dindonette to cast her spell over the fountain. It was the only spring of fresh water in the island, and at dawn was crowded with people of all ages come to drink at its source. Delighted at her plan for making them all happy, the fairy hid herself behind a thicket of roses, and peeped out whenever footsteps came that way. It was not long before she had ample proof of the success of her enchantments. Almost before her eyes the children put on the size and strength of adults, while the old men and women instantly became helpless tiny babies. Indeed, so pleased was she with the result of her work, that she could no longer remain hidden, and went about telling everybody what she had done, and enjoying their gratitude and thanks. But after the first outburst of delight at their wishes being granted, people began to be a little frightened at the rapid effects of the magic water. It was delicious to feel yourself at the height of your power and beauty, but you would wish to keep so always. Now this was exactly what the fairy had been in too much of a hurry to arrange, and no sooner had the children become grown up, and the men and women become babies, that they all rushed on to old age at an appalling rate. The fairy only found out her mistake when it was too late to set it right. When the inhabitants of the island saw what had befallen them, they were filled with despair and did everything they could think of to escape from such a dreadful fate. They dug wells in their places so that they should no longer need to drink from the magic spring. But the sandy soil yielded no water, and the rainy season was already past. They stored up the dew that fell and the juice of fruits and of herbs, but all this was as a drop in the ocean of their wants. Some threw themselves into the sea, trusting that the current might carry them to other shores. They had no boats. And a few, still more impatient, put themselves to death on the spot. The rest submitted blindly to their destiny. Perhaps the worst part of the enchantment was that the change from one age to another was so rapid that the person had no time to prepare himself for it. It would not have mattered so much if the man who stood up in the assembly of the nation to give his advice as to peace or war had looked like a baby, as long as he spoke with the knowledge and sense of a full-grown man. But, alas, with the outward form of an infant he had taken on its helplessness and foolishness, and there was no one who could train him to better things. The end of it all was that before a month had passed the population had died out, and the fairy, Dindonette, ashamed and grieved at the effects of her folly, had left the island for ever. Many centuries after, 
the fairy Selnazora, who had fallen into bad health, was ordered by her doctors to make the tour of the world twice a week for change of air, and in one of these journeys she found herself at Fountain Island. Selnazora never made these trips alone, but always took with her two children, of whom she was very fond. Cornichon, a boy of fourteen, bought in his childhood at a slave market, and Toupette, a few months younger, who had been entrusted to the care of the fairy by her guardian, the genius Christopo. Cornichon and Toupette were intended by Selnazora to become husband and wife as soon as they were old enough. Meanwhile they traveled with her in a little vessel whose speed through the air was just a thousand nine hundred and fifty times greater than that of the swiftest of our ships. Struck with the beauty of the island, Selnazora ran the vessel to ground, and, leaving it in the care of the dragon which lived in the hold during the voyage, stepped on shore with her two companions. Surprised at the sight of a large town whose streets and houses were absolutely desolate, the fairy resolved to put her magic arts in practice to find out the cause. While she was thus engaged, Cornichon and Toupette wandered away by themselves, and by and by arrived at the fountain, whose bubbling waters looked cool and delicious on such a hot day. Scarcely had they each drunk a deep draught, when the fairy, who by this time had discovered all she wished to know, hastened to the spot. Oh, beware, beware, she cried, the moment she saw them. If you drink that deadly poison, you will be ruined for ever. Poison? answered Toupette. It is the most refreshing water I have ever tasted, and Cornichon will say so too. Unhappy children, then I am too late. Why did you leave me? Listen, and I will tell you what has befallen the wretched inhabitants of this island, and what will befall you too. The power of fairies is great, she added, when she had finished her story, but they cannot destroy the work of another fairy. Very shortly you will pass into the weakness and silliness of extreme old age, and all I can do for you is to make it as easy to you as possible, and to preserve you from the death that others have suffered, from having no one to look after them. But the charm is working already. Cornichon is taller and more manly than he was an hour ago, and Toupette no longer looks like a little girl. It was true, but this fact did not seem to render the young people as miserable as it did Selnazora. Do not pity us, said Cornichon. If we are fated to grow old so soon, let us no longer delay our marriage. What matter if we anticipate our decay, if we only anticipate our happiness too? The fairy felt that Cornichon had reason on his side, and seeing by a glance at Toupette's face that there was no opposition to be feared from her, she answered, Let it be so, then, but not in this dreadful place. We will return at once to Bagota, and the festivities shall be the most brilliant ever seen. They all returned to the vessel, and in a few hours the four thousand five hundred miles that lay between the island and Bagota were passed. Everyone was surprised to see the change which the short absence had made in the young people, but as the fairy had promised absolute silence about the adventure, they were none the wiser, and busied themselves in preparing their dresses for the marriage, which was fixed for the next night. Early on the following morning the genius Christopo arrived at the court, on one of the visits he was in the habit of paying his ward from time to time. Like the rest he was astonished at the sudden improvement in the child. He had always been fond of her, and in a moment he fell violently in love. Hastily demanding an audience with the fairy, he laid his proposals before her, never doubting that she would give her consent to so brilliant a match. But Selnazora refused to listen, and even hinted that in his own interest Christopo had better turn his thoughts elsewhere. The genius pretended to agree, but instead he went straight to Toupette's room and flew away with her through the window at the very instant that the bridegroom was awaiting her below. When the fairy discovered what had happened, she was furious and sent messenger after messenger to the genius in his palace at Ratibouf, 
commanding him to restore Toupette without delay, and threatening to make war in case of refusal. Christopo gave no direct answer to the fairy's envoys, but kept Toupette closely guarded in a tower, where the poor girl used all her powers of persuasion to induce him to put off their marriage. All would, however, have been quite vain if, in the course of a few days, sorrow, joined to the spell of the magic water, had not altered her appearance so completely that Christopo was quite alarmed, and declared that she needed amusement and fresh air, and that, as his presence seemed to distress her, she would be left her own mistress. But one thing he declined to do, and that was to send her back to Bogota. In the meantime, both sides had been busily collecting armies, and Christopo had given the command of his to a famous general, while Selnazora had placed Cornichon at the head of her forces. But before war was actually declared, Toupet's parents, who had been summoned by the genius, arrived at Ratibouf. They had never seen their daughter since they parted from her as a baby, but from time to time travelers to Bogota had brought back accounts of her beauty. What was their amazement, therefore, at finding instead of a lovely girl a middle-aged woman, handsome indeed, but quite faded, looking in fact older than themselves? Christopo, hardly less astonished than they were at the sudden change, thought that it was a joke on the part of one of his courtiers who had hidden Toupette away and put this elderly lady in her place. Bursting with rage, he sent instantly for all the servants and guards of the town, and inquired who had the insolence to play him such a trick, and what had become of their prisoner. They replied that, since Toupette had been in their charge, she had never left her rooms unveiled, and that during her walks in the surrounding gardens, her food had been brought in and placed on her table. As she preferred to eat alone, no one had ever seen her face or knew what she was like. The servants were clearly speaking the truth, and Christopo was obliged to believe them. But, thought he, if they have not had a hand in this, it must be the work of the fairy, and in his anger he ordered the army to be ready to march. On her side, Selnazora, of course, knew what the genius had to expect, but was deeply offended when she heard of the base trick which she was believed to have invented. Her first desire was to give battle to Christopo at once, but with great difficulty her ministers induced her to pause, to send an ambassador to Christopo to try to arrange matters. So the prince Zaprati departed for the court of Ratibouf, and on his way he met Cornichon, who was encamped with his army just outside the gates of Bogota. The prince showed him the fairy's written order that, for the present, peace must still be kept, and Cornichon, filled with longing to see Toupette once more, begged to be allowed to accompany Soprati on his mission to Ratibouf. By this time the genius's passion for Toupette, which had caused all these troubles, had died out and he willingly accepted the terms of peace offered by Soprati, though he informed the prince that he still believed the fairy to be guilty of the dreadful change in the girl. To this the prince only replied that on that point he had a witness who could prove, better than anyone else, if it was Toupette or not, and desired that Cornichon should be sent for. When Toupette was told that she was to see her old lover again, her heart leapt with joy, but soon the recollection came to her of all that had happened, and she remembered that Cornichon would be changed as well as she. The moment of their meeting was not all happiness, especially on the part of Toupette, who could not forget her lost beauty, and the genius who was present was at last convinced that he had not been deceived, and went out to sign the treaty of peace followed by his attendants. Ah, Toupette, my dear Toupette, cried Cornichon, as soon as they were left alone, now that we are once more united, let our past troubles be forgotten. Our past troubles, answered she, and what do you call our lost beauty in the dreadful future before us? You are looking fifty years older than when I last saw you, and I know too well that fate has treated me no better. Ah, do not say that replied Cornichon, clasping her hand. 
You are different, it is true, but every age has its graces, and surely no woman of sixty was ever handsomer than you. If your eyes had been as bright as of yore, they would have matched badly with your faded skin. The wrinkles which I noticed on your forehead explain the increased fullness of your cheeks, and your throat in withering is elegant in decay. Thus the harmony shown by your features, even as they grow old, is the best proof of their former beauty. "'Oh, monster!' cried Toupette, bursting into tears. "'Is that all the comfort you can give me?' "'But, Toupette,' answered Cornichon, "'you used to declare that you did not care for beauty as long as you had my heart.' "'Yes, I know,' said she. "'But how can you go on caring for a person who is old and plain as I?' Toupette, Toupette, replied Cornichon, you are only talking nonsense. My heart is as much yours as ever it was, and nothing in the world can make any difference. At this point in the conversation, Prince Zafrati entered the room with the news that the genius, full of regret for his behavior, had given Cornichon full permission to depart for Bogota as soon as he liked, and to take Toupette with him adding that, though he begged they would excuse his taking leave of them before they went, he hoped before long to visit them at Bogota. Neither of the lovers slept that night, Cornichon from joy at returning home, Toupette from dread of the blow to her vanity which awaited her at Bogota. It was hopeless for Cornichon to try to console her during the journey with the reasons he had given the day before. She only grew worse and worse, and when they reached the palace went straight to her old apartments, entreating the fairy to allow both herself and Cornichon to remain concealed and to see no one. From time to time after their arrival the fairy was taken up with the preparations for the rejoicings which were to celebrate the peace, and with the reception of the genius who was determined to do all in his power to regain Selnazora's lost friendship. Cornichon and Toupette were therefore left entirely to themselves, and though this was only what they wanted, still they began to feel a little neglected. At length one morning they saw from the windows that the fairy and the genius were approaching, in state, with all their courtiers and attendants. Toupette instantly hid herself in the darkest corner of the room, but Cornichon, forgetting that he was now no longer a boy of fourteen, ran to meet them. In so doing, he tripped and fell, bruising one of his eyes severely. At the sight of her lover lying helpless on the floor, Toupette hastened to his side, but her feeble legs gave way under her, and she fell almost on top of him, knocking out three of her loosened teeth against his forehead. The fairy who entered the room at this moment burst into tears and listened in silence to the genius who hinted that by and by everything would be put right. At the last assembly of the fairies, he said, when the doings of each fairy were examined and discussed, a proposal was made to lessen, as far as possible, the mischief caused by Dindinette by enchanting the fountain, and it was decided that, as she had meant nothing but kindness, she should have the power of undoing one half of the spell. Of course she might always have destroyed the fatal fountain, which would have been best of all, but this she never thought of. Yet in spite of this her heart is so good that I am sure that the moment she hears that she is wanted she will fly to help. Only before she comes it is for you, madam, to make up your mind which of the two shall regain their former strength and beauty. At these words the fairy's soul sank. Both Cornichon and Toupette were equally dear to her, and how could she favor one at the cost of the other? As to the courtiers, none of the men were able to understand why she hesitated a second to declare for Toupette, while the ladies were equally strong on the side of Cornichon. But however undecided the fairy might be, it was quite different with Cornichon and Toupette. Ah, oh, my love, exclaimed Cornichon, at length I shall be able to give you the best proof of my devotion by showing you how I value the beauties of your mind above those of your body. While the most charming women of the court will fall victims to my youth and strength, I shall think of nothing but how to lay them at your feet, 
and pay heartfelt homage to your age and wrinkles. Not so fast, interrupted Toupette. I don't see why you should have it all. Why do you heap such humiliations upon me? But I will trust to the justice of the fairy who will not treat me so. Then she entered her own rooms and refused to leave them in spite of the prayers of Cornichon who begged her to let him explain. No one at the court thought or spoke of any other subject during the few days before the arrival of Dindonette, whom everybody expected to set things right in a moment. But alas, she had no idea herself what was best to be done, and always adopted the opinion of the person she was talking to. At length a thought struck her, which seemed the only way of satisfying both parties, and she asked the fairy to call together all the court and the people to hear her decision. Happy is he, she began, who can repair the evil he has caused, but happier he who has never caused any. As nobody contradicted this remark, she continued, To me it is only allowed to undo one half of the mischief I have wrought. I could restore you your youth, she said to Cornichon, or your beauty, turning to Toupette. I will do both, and I will do neither. A murmur of curiosity arose from the crowd while Cornichon and Toupette trembled with astonishment. No, went on Dindinette, never should I have the cruelty to leave one of you to decay while the other enjoys the glory of youth. And, as I cannot restore you both at once to what you were, one half of each of your bodies shall become young again, while the other half goes on its way to decay. I will leave it to you to choose which half it shall be, if I shall draw a line around the waist or a line straight down the middle of the body. She looked about her proudly, expecting applause for her clever idea, but Cornichon and Toupette were shaking with rage and disappointment, and every one else broke into shouts of laughter. In pity for the unhappy lovers, Selnazora came forward. Do you not think, she said, that instead of what you propose, it would be better to let them take it in turns to enjoy their former youth and beauty for a fixed time? I am sure you could easily manage that. What an excellent notion! cried Dindinette. Oh, yes, of course, that is best. Which of you shall I touch first? Touch her, replied Cornichon, who was always ready to give way to Toupette. I know her heart too well to fear any change. So the fairy bent forward and touched her with her magic ring, and in one instant the old woman was a girl again. The whole court wept with joy at the sight, and Toupette ran up to Cornichon, who had fallen down in his surprise, promising to pay him long visits and tell him of all her balls and water parties. The two fairies went to their own apartments, where the genius followed them to take his leave. "'Oh, dear!' suddenly cried Dindinette breaking into the farewell speech of the genius, I quite forgot to fix the time when Cornichon should in his turn grow young. How stupid of me! And now I fear it is too late, for I ought to have declared it before I touched Toupette with the ring. Oh, dear, oh, dear, why did nobody warn me? You were so quick, replied Selnazora, who had long been aware of the mischief the fairy had again done and we can only wait now till Cornichon shall have reached the utmost limits of its decay, when he will drink of the water and become a baby once more, so that Toupette will have to spend her life as a nurse, a wife, and a caretaker. After the anxiety of mind and the weakness of body to which for so long Toupette had been a prey, it seemed as if she could not amuse herself enough and it was seldom indeed that she found time to visit poor Cornichon, though she did not cease to be fond of him or to be kind to him. Still she was perfectly happy without him, and this poor man did not fail to see, almost blind and deaf from age, though he was. But it was left to Cristopo to undo at last the work of Dindinette, and give Cornichon back the youth he had lost, and this the genius did all the more gladly, as he discovered quite by accident that Cornichon was in fact his son. It was on this plea that he attended the great yearly meeting of the fairies, and prayed that, in consideration of his services to so many of the members, 
this one boon might be granted him. Such a request had never before been heard in Fairyland, and was objected to by some of the older fairies, but both Cristopo and Seldazora were held in such high honor that the murmurs of disgust were set aside, and the latest victim to the enchanted fountain was pronounced to be free of the spell. All that the genius asked in return was that he might accompany the fairy back to Bogota to be present when his son assumed his proper shape. They made up their minds they would just tell Tupet that they had found a husband for her, and give her a pleasant surprise at the wedding, which was fixed for the following night. She heard the news with astonishment, and many pangs for the grief which Cornichon would certainly feel at his place being taken by another, but she did not dream of disobeying the fairy, and spent the whole day wondering who the bridegroom could be. At the appointed hour a large crowd assembled at the fairy's palace, which was decorated with the sweetest flowers known only to fairyland. Toupette had taken her place, but where was the bridegroom? Fetch Cornichon, said the fairy to her chamberlain. But Toupette interposed, Oh, madam, spare him, I entreat you, this bitter pain, and let him remain hidden and in peace. It is necessary that he should be here, answered the fairy, and he will not regret it. As she spoke, Cornichon was let in, smiling with the foolishness of extreme old age at the sight of the gay crowd. "'Bring him here,' commanded the fairy, waving her hand toward Tupet, who started back from surprise and horror. Selnazora then took the hand of the poor old man, and the genius came forward and touched him three times with his ring, when Cornichon was transformed into a handsome young man. "'May you live long!' the genius said, to enjoy happiness with your wife and to love your father. And that was the end of the mischief wrought by the fairy Dindonette. End of chapter 33